Hey everybody, I'm Dr. Rob Silverman here. I'm excited. We've got the answers. We are going to debunk all the proverbial myths in low-level laser. I've got two superstar researchers from Arconia Corp today. Um, let me tell you just a little bit about Arconia if anybody doesn't know about them yet. Arconia was founded in 1996 as a small family business and has since grown into an international enterprise. They've got 20 FDA market clearances. 2002 was their first chronic neck and shoulder pain. They've got chronic plantar fasciitis. They've also got chronic lower back pain, chronic neck and shoulder pain using a red and a violet, overall nociceptive musculoskeletal pain, the first in the market to attain that. And they, in their 20th FDA clearance, just got one for whole body post-operative pain. So who do we have? We've got the president of Raconia and the lead clinical researcher, Mr. Steve Shanks, and clinical affairs manager, we've got Mr. Travis Simons. Gentlemen, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for taking time. I'm excited to uh, do rapid fire questions and debunk all the myths on low level laser. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, excited Appreciate it. So you guys ready? And by the way, anybody watching, the, the questions are already coming in. Um, Let's just get in and make the first one a real easy one so people understand. What is laser? What does the acronym mean? It's light amplification by stimulation of radiation. And it's good to know the properties of laser, especially the ampli amplification part. So what you're doing when you have a laser diode is you're collecting the energy and you're broadcasting it, which normally will come out in a small spot or a dot. Um, you're gonna see a lot of products on the market for instance, LEDs, they're not lasers, they're not coherent, um, and they broadcast everywhere. So you need the coherency, James Oshman stated in his book, Energy Medicine, that lasers speak in a coherent laser-like fashion. When you get into the class four lasers that are therapeutic, what they're doing is they're taking a focusing lens off of it, and now they're creating a large spot, which is topically heating the skin. So they're losing the properties of, of laser therapy. So great, great stuff. You talked about coherency. So coherency is a focus beam of light that emits photons. And I know we're going to go into more detail on photons. All photons moving in the same direction, same color, they call that coherent. Now, you talked about classes, class four. Can you run through the classes, class one, two, three, and four, and which um, class Arconia falls under? And this is where it gets confusing. Um, any device that's FDA cleared will become a class two medical device. Inside the medical devices, there's laser classes, and those are dependent on power. Uh, our lasers are 3B lasers, means they're over five milliwatts. Um, when you get up into the higher powers, you get over 500 milliwatts, you get into class four lasers, and those are uh, all the devices that are approved for top, topical heating. So a class four in a nutshell, would it be fair to say typically generates heat? Yes. And, and a class 3B doesn't because it bases its efficacy on photons and photochemistry and phototherapy versus thermal uh, enhancement, let's say. Yeah, and it's how the devices work. Low level lasers work through biostimulation. Um, the mechanism for uh, class four lasers is heat. Interesting to, to note with the heat category, that started out as a heat lamp in 1976 mm. because all those devices were FDA cleared. So that turned into diathermy. Uh, class four lasers got smart. They said, look, is, we'll, we'll take the focusing lens off, create a spot beam, and we'll start topically heating. None of these devices have ever been proven efficacious through a blinded control clinical trial. So the only mechanism of action they could claim is heat. But if you look at their websites, that's not what they're gonna claim. They'll call themselves low level laser therapy. Um, because there's not a lot of, there's not any uh, class four lasers that have been FDA market cleared through a blind and controlled clinical trial. Amazing. So for me as a practitioner, and we've had this conversation, gentlemen, all the time, I'm not a proponent and many of my colleagues are not a proponent of generating heat because we know that heat in many instances can be deleterious. Whereas what you're speaking about with the photochemical uh, effect, allowing the cells to communicate and healing the body from inside out is good for all different case scenarios in a musculoskeletal arena. Absolutely correct. And that's what me and Travis do. Um, we work with the FDA, work with, work with researchers to do blind and controlled clinical trials, come up with new indications. 
Excellent. So again, so for me, the big why, why, you know, people always ask us, why do we use lasers? And I, and I want you to chime in with this. I, at each point, I believe that it heals by the speed of light. And I think you clarified that with the photons. You guys are research driven, 20 FDA clearances and, and something that we miss. And I'm sure you get all the time if you want to tell a, a story about it, is that empirical research, that practitioner who calls you up. I mean, Again, you could retire. You've done what you've needed to do. That practitioner who calls you up and says, you know what? You changed my life or a patient's life. Do you have an anecdote to that? Yeah. The stuff that we that comes in through our website about some of the conditions that we hear about, we can't even talk about it because obviously we're regulated by the FDA. So what we do is from there, we go to, to a pilot study proof concept and then run that through the FDA and get market clearances which were, were pretty unique in the, in the laser industry. Yeah, so in my office, I've seen some great things. And, you know, full disclosure, everybody knows that I do lecture for Coney. I've been on multiple times on uh, social media discussing it. I do so because it changed my life. I have congenital torticollis. <clears throat> um, I've spoken about it before. I need a methodology to extend my career. Uh, adjustments were becoming difficult because of fusion in my neck. So I came across the laser, was recommended from a friend. I'm able to apply it to myself. It grew into my uh, friends and family, and now I use it as an anchor, if you will, uh, a baseline uh, treatment with virtually all my patients. So having said all that, what would you classify for those listening are the critical factors for laser efficiency? Uh, number one is power. Um, there's a Arndt Schultz law that was 1998 stated that weak stimuli excites biological activity. That's what we're looking for. Um, moderate ones will suppress it. And if you overstimulate, you're going to start creating damage. That's the typical theory that's been brought on with low level laser therapy. And it's something that we definitely agree with. Um, we are totally into low level laser therapy. And Travis is gonna cite some research for you that we've come across through the years that basically proves our theory of concept. Yeah, so Rob, I know you read it, but anyone else join us today, I would definitely advise reading a Harvard article called Biphasic Dose Response and Low-Level Laser Therapy. Uh, basically, they did a, like a literature review. And to sum it up, three to five joules per centimeter square is beneficial. 50 to 100 joules per centimeter square was detrimental. Uh, perfect closing line as well. Low-level laser delivered at low doses tends to work better than the same wavelength delivered at high levels. So everything your pony has practiced, practiced and preached over the last 20 years is really concluded in that one sentence. Uh, there's also another great article, we'll be happy to send it to you. It's uh, University of Jonesboro. They did a study using 632 nanometers on mitochondria activity. Uh, they stayed in there, they actually they were using a three milliwatt. So you got laser company out there using a three watts. So this was a three milliwatt laser that they had to spread over a divergent beam because at three milliwatts in the spot diode, it was causing DNA damage. So in that, that shows you power. It's definitely important. Um, obviously, once you get into the watts, you're, you're, you're dealing with DNA damage milliwatts it's still important that you spread that over the line generated beam which arconia does okay so let me unpack what you just said now we have handheld lasers we've got an accelerate we've got an evrl they're different in that the accelerate has the red light which we will get into wavelength i know steve is going to talk about that and the evrl has both a red and a violet and then we've got the fx series so can you talk about the power with them so they understand that you guys really are at the low level laser or low power lasers. Yeah, um, so as you know, Rob, all of our uh, laser devices are line generated beams. We do that by design because we're trying to disperse the energy. We've never really bought in the joules per two cubic centimeter squared um, argument. So we use red, green, and violet. And the reason why we're using different wavelengths is to create different photochemical effects. Um, you know, the powers that we use, seven and a half milliwatts spread over a line, we're basically um, trying to spread the energy out over time because it's more effective, like Travis just stated in that article. So 
basically that um, biophasic dose response said the same energy delivered over time is much more effective than delivering all that energy at one laser spot. Well, I think we're getting with I, we're getting towards a couple of terms that I know you want to address. There was a great question, and uh, the, the question was I, I think what what they um, hold on let me get it up there. I think it's homesis. I don't know it's homostasis, but it's very funny because homesis can cause homostasis. So why don't we tell everybody what that means and how the Arconia laser never has the, ne the negative effect of the inverted U-shaped curve. Okay, so hormesis is similar to Arndt Schultz law. Basically, if you have small doses of something, they're stimulatory. If you have large doses, they become overstimulatory and could cause damage. So that's pretty much the theory behind homostasis. Uh, hormesis. So if you're going to look at low-level laser therapy, like Travis mentioned, the therapeutic window is usually up to five joules per cubic centimeter squared. Now, when you look at a, a joules per cubic centimeter squared, you're looking at a, about a half inch area. Most lasers that are out in the market are delivering that energy in a spot, and then they'll move it to the next spot and move it to the next spot. The beauty of the Arconia lasers is that now we've created a line, we've dispersed that energy over, and we're trying to create photochemistry by spinning the laser or manually scanning the laser. So you're never gonna to get to the point with hormesis from overstimulation. And you can read thousands of articles about overstimulating with low-level laser therapy. And, it, and, it, yeah, and Rob, I know we we actually spoke about that this morning, you and I, uh, and like I was telling you, take the FX635, for example, which is the robotic line-generated beam scanner that we have. If you look at the bell-shaped curve, the top or where you start to dip down is five joules. At 10 joules, you're really causing that detrimental effect. With the FX scanner, as I mentioned, it, it would take over 10, 10 hours of use, constant use, to start hitting that slope of the bell-shaped curve. I think that's worth repeating. It would take 10 hours of constant laser application or constant Arconia laser application to have any kind of damage. Now, as a practitioner, you know, I don't laser for 10 hours in a row. My laser time is no more than 20 or 30 minutes. And I, I think that it's really important that people know in the FX series, the diode is moving. It's mm -hmm. circulating. In the handheld, you can move it also. It's not the patient moving, but you can move it. So you're really never going to get to that. So I, I understand a lot of people have concerns, but I'm very happy you guys explain the way the construct of our of, of your guys' laser doesn't reach damage for 10 guys nobody's lasering for 10 hours and if they are they, they don't sleep for 10 hours now i do have a couple of quick questions um and i i want to answer the people's questions i have some others because you know people pop in and out a little bit so here we go i'm popping it up and if so i why don't you guys address the non-thermal laser instead of the thermal technology you did and i'll address the shockwave Okay, so with non-thermal lasers, um, we're trying to create a photochemical effect. Um, similar to a drug with a biochemical effect, low-level lasers create photochemical effects. So we're looking more of a systemic effect. We're, we're looking to boost immune function. When you start turning up the power with lasers, or if you use an infrared laser, all you're doing is vibrating the cell. So the more power you turn, turn, turn up, the more you vibrate the cell, the more, the more heat you create. So ours is a photochemical effect with visible light compared to a thermal effect with infrared light. We do not use infrared light. We do not believe that it's efficacious. Um, there are very few that have been proven through blind and control clinical trials. Um, very few that are FDA cleared. Um, we are a research and development company. Early on, 1998, 99, played around with some of the uh, infrared lasers. We didn't see much clinical results. So what we see as a company is we keep going to shorter, more energetic wavelengths that can take that energy and pass it on from cell to cell. So what most people don't understand is with a visible light 405 nanometer uh, laser has 40% 40, 40 more energy than an infrared laser. That's per photon. So if I'm looking for cell transfer, if I'm looking to create a photochemical effect, I want more energy, not a 
more power. So it's the difference, you need to understand the difference between energy and power. So we're big energy people. We're looking for energy transfer, not power transfer, because when you turn up the power, again, the, the, the cells are blocking it and you start creating heat as you're vibrating the cells. To, so, and to expound on that, the last part of that question there, shockwave therapy, I'm sure there's beneficial results. I mean, I've seen a lot of their studies out there, but you're talking about two different mechanism action. They're going to try to ignite apoptosis so the body starts to heal itself. Low level laser, we've done plenty of research at University of California, San Diego, University of Illinois, that shows that we reduce apoptosis. So one is trying to ignite it, the way the body heals itself, we're preventing it. Two completely different mechanisms. It's like Travis is saying, if you use a shock wave and you go create damage to the area, um, the theory is that I'll start bringing more blood and nutrients to the area um, because of the damage to, to heal itself. And through that process, eventually it'll take care of the condition. Well, ours is completely different than that. We're using low level lasers to get blood nutrients um, to the area, boost immune function. Like Travis said, we've already proved this all at, at all the universities we um, use. We can reduce inflammation. It's just a different way of looking at it. Um, if you look at shock waves, blind and controlled studies compared to the over 20 blind and controlled studies we've seen and compared to, there's not, there's, there's a huge difference. And again, we're not creating damage. You cannot create damage with low level laser therapy. Right. And I, I think one of the biggest things that we can unpack from what you guys said is it's electromagnetic transfer of energy. I like to tell all my patients it's photosynthesis of the body. Right. That's exactly what it is. Right. So it's an easy task. You guys are really giving meat on the bone, if you will. And it's fabulous. Um, the, let me get another question in here. How laser therapy is used in brain health and neurotherapy? You know, it's funny. I was prepared, and I'm going to hit a, and I'm going to let you guys take it after this. Um, there's a great article in 2017 that came out, and in that it spoke about laser therapy and all the positives in the brain. So it allows for the increase of what we call BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factors. They allow for brain neurogenesis to increase neuroplasticity, as Travis just said. They allow for the decrease in apoptosis. They create the microenvironment of the brain to be anti-inflammatory because some of the biggest problems with a brain injury is its ability to be inflamed. Um, in addition to that, there's an article that I just wrote, which we can, we can add any articles in the um, comment section or the notes to what we're doing today. Uh, chiropractic economics spoke about a article that I wrote in that applying the laser to the gut allow for gut healing and a change in the microbiome. And we all know that the gut and the brain are bi-directional and what we like to refer to as a super highway to health. Having said all that, I know that there's some studies that you guys want to cite about brain health and neurotherapy because you know, I know Stephen Travis, that is your, uh, that's your jam, if you will. So first of all, as the president of uh, Arconia Corporation, I do not want the FDA walking in, in my door. So we do not make any claims at this point for brain health. We're doing lots of research in different areas, autism, Alzheimer's disease. Um, we've done some you know, QEEG studies showing that we can activate certain areas of the brain. Um, for our neck and shoulder clinical trials, we do laser the, the cerebral area. Um, basically the thought process being that, you know, if I have an injury on my right side, my cerebellum controls the right side, maybe we can inhibit pain by lasering the brain. Um, we've done that with red. We've done it with red-violet lasers. And we do have lots of uh, research that we're doing, but at this point, it's hard for us to talk about brain health um, because that is outside of 510K. And if this is broadcasted, whoever reads this, um, it's just hard for us to talk about it. All good, all good. Um, I did want to ask you, because there's a lot of questions at different seminars and people online about what we call the frequency, you know, the amount that the light hits the skin per second. So some people see it as a beeping light. I know you'll address this. Some people see it as a straight light. Um, should we vary it? How, how much does it matter? What's your take on the frequency of the beaming of light? Back in 2003, um, I say about 2000 when we started pulsing our lasers, we noticed a big difference 
and the clinical benefit. So for we, we wanted to go out and prove to ourselves that there was actually a difference between pulsing the light and constant wave. So at that point, the number one low-level laser researcher in the world was a gentleman named Farouk Fru, Elwat out of Saudi Arabia. So we gave him four different pulsations um, to look at to see how they healed rats, because he basically does all, all rat studies. They all healed at a different rate. Um, come forward 20 years now, um, as we're looking at frequencies in the body, if you're gonna look at your alpha, theta, theta, beta waves, they all pulse at a different frequency and they're all moving constantly. You know, it's just not static. You usually have a range of what they are. Um, we know what the firing of a nerve is. So we will, we will import those into our clinical trials um, and then prove them through clinical trials that pulse laser therapy works. All of our clinical trials has, has, has pulse laser therapy. The reason why some of it looks like a constant wave and some of it looks like a light going off and on is after you get about 30 hertz, you can no longer tell a difference because it looks like a constant wave beam, even though the light is, the light is pulsing. We do not advertise our frequencies. They're all, they're all hard coded into our, um, our devices. Um, we do that by design. We are probably the most copied uh, laser company on the planet. Um, so if you want Arconius protocols, legally, through the FDA, we can hardwire those in. Now, we have a lot of doctors that like to use their own frequencies, which they're, they're welcome to do. And I suggest that you guys experiment as much as you like. So I, I hope that answers your question. It really does. So I'm a big, I'm a, and I'm gonna chime in, I'm a big proponent on the variety of the frequency, because I think, you know, we- Can I answer that? Let me answer that question for you. So back in, we were doing a lot of burn research in 2002 and 2003. And what we found out is when we treated the, um, the patients with the same frequencies, they started adapting almost like if they were taking a farm, you know, pharmaceutical intervention. So what we did at that point is that's when we started coming up with the multi-frequency lasers. So the body could not adapt to the same frequencies. I hope that helps. I think it does. So I think it speaks to the idea that we do want a variety in the frequencies within different realms and uh, to use the same frequency on every patient every time, you may not be optimizing the usage of how the construct of the laser is. Yeah, so our, our theory has, has always been the body can handle a lot of stimulus. You know, I can hear your voice. Um, I can hear Travis breathing. I can hear my air conditioning in the background. My body can handle all that stimulus. The more stimulus that we throw at the body, which we believe is pulsations, um, we believe that the more efficacious the laser is. I got it. I got a question for you guys. What experience do you have using non-thermal lasers on skin conditions, wounds, and burns? They've extrapolated. It sounds like non-thermal lasers are empowering the patient at a cellular level to help fix whatever their condition. Yes. So we've done lots of research on skin conditions, um, a lot on, on burns. It's like Travis was talking about. That's one of our, our apoptosis uh, necrosis study was. We looked at a lot of blood flow. Um, we were going to pursue the FDA for uh, an indication for burns, but there's 123 burn clinics in the United States. It's not a very big market. Um, wound healing for us, it's, almost, it's really hard to prove because the inclusion exclusion criteria. So we are currently running a study on peripheral neuropathies um, that hopefully somewhere in the future will, will happen. Um, so there's lots and lots of research on non-thermal lasers on wounds, burns. Um, we have looked at it, but for us, we do not advertise it because we do not have a market clearance for it. There is a study, I, I don't have the reference with me, but they use 632 uh, laser for wound healing. They looked at gene expression uh, with 0.88 joules per centimeter square. I believe, Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, it was like 188 genes were either upregulated up or downregulated just with laser itself. And a lot of those, a lot of those related to, you know, DNA repair, apoptosis, angiogenesis. Interleukin 10, stimulate the immune function. Yeah. That also said it drove seven different pathways in the body. So we can make these studies that you can read, but this is all really low energy stuff. Um, and we read all this stuff a long time ago. You know, we, with us, we kind of more than a de decrease in the power than adding to it. Yeah, you know, um, so many people have so many questions on the frequency and the power. And I think there's a concept that I'd love you guys to just um, clear up, give a little clarity to. 
absorption versus penetration with the laser cellular they got they got the idea of the cell communicating because the body's all interconnected i'm happy to see that if you could address what i just asked that would be fabulous yeah absorption penetrations are probably some of the biggest myths in laser therapy so if you're looking at absorption um the first law of photochemistry is that for a laser to be used in photochemistry it has to be absorbed and knowing that you only get photochemistry with visible light so as you're using a high energy photon, which is visible light, you're going to get more absorption. Um, think of, you know, we like to use the analogy of if I take an NSAID or an opioid and I swallow it in my stomach, how far does it penetrate? That's called biochemistry. We all know that you get a lot of side effects with that um, because you're using something that's not natural. You're doing the same thing with photochemistry where we're taking it to an area, but from there, it's like throwing a rock in a pond. That energy is spread out through the entire system. Now, how do we know that? Um, most people are familiar with our Zorona technology. Um, when we first came out with the device, everybody was saying, well, all you're doing is lasering away tips and thighs, and you're, you're basically fat shifting. The fat's going everywhere else. So we published a study in laser and surgery medicine on, I think it was 588 consecutive patients. So we lasered waist tips and thighs, measured knees, ankles, um, and chest, and everything shrunk. Low-level lasers there with systemic effects, it's now well-proven. If you're looking at infrared lasers, they work completely different. The energy is not absorbed. When it hits the tissue, it's vibrating the cell. Why? Because it doesn't have enough energy. Um, my, my opinion is because it's, you're throwing so many photons at it because they eject power up that um, all you're doing is creating heat. So it, it's just a different way of looking at therapy. So we've got a, we got a quickie. I think the answer pretty good. Why aren't we aware? It's a great question of all the technological uh, technologies that fall under the low-level laser umbrella. It's very, you know, they're expecting you guys to talk about everything else, but it, it's it's a question I'm asked all the time. So if you could just quickly address it, it would be great. Um, why aren't you aware? Obviously, we're doing what we can. Um, the you know, if you're looking at uh, the tr traditional medical field. Um, it's a tough field. You walk into a doctor's office, all they're doing is prescribing a drug. They don't do therapies. So we fight the MA, the AMA. Um, you should see some stuff we have to go to try to get a CPD code. Um, most doctors aren't taught low level laser therapy in school. Um, it's a 25 year process. With us, we're trying to educate everybody. Um, and we publish in journals everywhere except laser journals. Because as you guys know, in the laser field, class four lasers will call themselves low-level lasers. LEDs will say that they're just as good as low-level lasers. They're different. Um, and again, low-level lasers, you have to do blind and controlled clinical trials to get new indications. Um, there's no companies that I know of right now besides us trying to get more indications through, through low-level laser therapy. So we're kind of like the standard bearer. Um, and we're just a small family business. And, you know, we plan on staying that way. It, just because the term's already there, but there's a new uh, kind of catch-all term or umbrella term called laser photobiomodulation. I know Steve, you love that term. Yeah. <laughs> uh, pretty much they, they took what used to be just low-level laser research. If you go to PubMed, type in low-level laser, you're going to get 10,000 results. If you type in high-power laser or high-intensity laser, I think we looked it up, you maybe get two dozen. Um, most of that was ablating the tissue. But photobiomodulation now encompasses low-level laser, infrared laser, high-power laser, and broadband light. Those are completely different mechanisms from each one. Like Steve mentioned, low-level laser is completely non-thermal. It's under 500 millivolts. Infrared or high-power laser is over 500, and it's photothermal. And then broadband lights, more of your LED, where it's scattered lighter or scattered photons. So higher power, non-coherent heating, coherent, lower power, photochemical. Yep. Yep. And so you know, that, that's, that's the takeaway. A lot of people don't realize that. And, you know, we're not, we're not using any names, but that's a critical concept 
to patient optimization for their outcomes. Somebody asked one more question on the frequency. Essentially, they said, why would you use different frequencies in different symptoms? So I think what they're trying to say is, why would you change the frequency if someone had an acute versus a chronic condition? Well, my theory is if you have an acute condition, um, um, your, your, your nervous system is overstimulated. So we would use a, you know, a lesser frequency, maybe somewhere in the one to 30 range to try to slow that down. Because with, you know, especially with red laser, your body's trying to, trying to regulate everything. So something more in a chronic condition, we might turn the frequencies up to try to stimulate more. Um, and that's, that's kind of worked for us. Um, and you can Google a lot of frequencies. They're on, you know, you can look online. You can look, you could Google alpha, data, theta, beta waves. They're there. Um, you know, we know what the healthy frequency of, of, of nerve is. So why wouldn't we use those kind of frequencies? Agreed. And again, I'm a proponent of starting and always variety. Another question that just came in, a lot, the distance from the skin. So should, it, should the laser be applied on the site, on the skin, or from a distance? And if so, what's best for outcomes? So again, we believe and we think we've proven that you're better off being away from the skin. So if I used a dot laser and I say I was four, away, uh, four inches away from the skin, um, it's not going to make much difference because you're still going to get the same energy. Lasers are going to go on for miles until they hit a target. Our philosophy is that by taking that energy, like Travis cited later, earlier in that Johannesburg study, and spread it out on a line, we're going to create a more efficacious photochemical effect. And whether it's manually scanned or mechanically scanned, that's what we use in our clinical trials. We're targeting a specific area and we'll make the light as big as the area next to the skin as possible. So usually we're three to four inches from the skin um, and none of our stuff touches the skin, which at this point is a huge benefit because now we're, we're in a surgical setting, we're not in the surgical field. People with, that are afraid of like a COVID and stuff like that and germs, we're not touching the skin. So now that's turned into an even bigger benefit for us. And efficaciously with laser therapy, it just works better. You know, and some people actually ask the question, like, why doesn't it go through the skin? And we've got Norman Deutsch, a psychiatrist, really well known. It's called The Brain's Way of Healing, chapter three and four of the choice. He gives a great example of how light gets through the skin and the skull with Billy Rubin and a child being yellow, put him in the light. So we know that it goes through the skin and the skull. <laughs> the other question that they're going to ask, and it's blowing up right now, real simple, clothing or skin? It's, you know, this is one of those questions that, you know, it's a physicist question, but here, here's my theory. Anytime you can get right next to the skin, I would do it. Um, for instance, if you're doing chronic neck and shoulder pain and you're treating C5, C6, C7, you could go right to the neck. If you don't want somebody to disrobe in your office because you're gonna treat their shoulder, you're probably gonna go right through the skin. So we would treat right on the spinous process and over the shoulder. Um, so those clinical trials, you know, we don't know when the doctors were treating the patients because we're blinded to that, but a lot of doctors go right, will go through the clothes. Now, we did an experiment one time looking at the holes in your clothes. Uh, photon is about the smallest particle known to man. You can get 973 photons per hole in your cloth. So if it takes one photon to create photochemistry, which Travis can cite that study for you, and we're emitting between 17 and 20 billion photons per second, and say we're treating for two or three minutes, how many of those photons do you need to get through the, through the shirt or the skin to create a photochemical effect? Not many. So I hope that, an that answers the question. If you can go right on skin, I highly suggest you do it. If you can't, um, that's up to the practitioner. So skin is better. The, the clothes will give scatter. But I think I heard you say, and correct me if I'm wrong, over 8 billion photons per diode? We'll, we'll emit between 17, depending on the wavelength, between about 17 and 20 billion photons per second. Okay, so you may scatter, but as long as there's one photon through the concept of power one, it's still going to work. But skin is better, but clothes do work because for some practitioners, they're not going to be able to get on skin in certain areas of the body. Yeah, let's try to 
Talk about that, that study that you have about the one photon. Oh, yeah, let me uh, just sort of quote it correctly. Okay, so this is uh, Stanford University article, uh, the photobiological basis of low level radiation therapy. And then direct quote from the article, in principle, one photon can activate one enzyme molecule, which in turn can process many thousands of subsequent molecules. If the effect of one, pho one photon can be amplified biologically, then one does not need a lot of photons to produce an effect. So that would be our explanation for treating through clothes. So your naysayers, are, your naysayers are going to say, well, that's ridiculous. You know, we proved it in blind and controlled clinical trials. So got a couple of questions, guys, because I know your time is valuable. When you're talking about treating the nerve root, he's essentially saying you never want to heat a nerve. And that's the reason that you always want a low-level laser. Rock kind has shown tremendous uh, studies for peripheral nerves. You don't want to massage a nerve. You may want to do a, a soft tissue nerve entrapment. So just address the nerve root and why the low-level laser via rock kind, if you can, is your choice or a choice modality. Because for me, guys, and I, I, I didn't say this at the beginning, the Oconia laser is the most versatile healthcare modality of the 21st century. Yeah, so if you're talking about treating a nerve root with um, a thermal laser, it's contraindicated. There's, you know, there's competitors out there, now they're treating the brain with thermal, with, with these high power thermal lasers, which is ridiculous. Um, there's, there's a reason why your skin is heating up. It doesn't want the energy. If you've got the sun too long, you're getting a sunburn. Um, we believe in the nerve root. Um, there's studies where Back in 19, probably 1998, I read a study where they treated carpal tunnel and they just treated C5 through C7. And they got better results than just treating the wrist. We've all, we think if you're not treating the nerve root to the area, I don't care whether it's acute or chronic condition, you're probably not giving the best treatment possible. Let's do a little rapid fire. Do dark colors attract and intensify the light amplification? A lot of questions I get like that at, at different seminars. Okay, dark colors are going to absorb light. That's what they do. Um, darker skin is probably going to absorb laser therapy. How much is absorbed? We don't know. All we know is what's refracted, and that's the light that we're seeing. Um, again, we're looking, you know, what's absorbed and what's used in photochemistry. We don't know because it's being absorbed and used in photochemistry. We looked at a, uh, the publication that we recently put out of overall muscle skeletal pain had 587 subjects that we treated over the past 20 years. We actually had our statistical consultant break down by demographics and then uh, ethnicity as well. There was no difference in results between your skin tone. Um, there was a little bit of difference between age groups. Uh, it, it seemed like the younger age responded quicker to laser. Which makes sense. Which makes sense yeah. in the, the older. But skin tones didn't make a difference. And we. we you know, with our fat reduction technology, whether it's, you know, um, Zorona or Emerald, same thing. Um, skin tone just doesn't, it, we, we, not, we haven't seen it make a difference. And you guys mentioned colors and different wavelengths. So we've got the violet 405 nanometer, we've got the 635, and we've got the green wavelengths. Can you briefly go over the different properties on the visible light scale with the wavelengths that you guys use at this moment? Yeah, so we, we do a lot of research. Uh, great study we, we did at University of Illinois where, on animals where we, uh, we basically regenerated a dead kidney. So when we started looking at what wavelengths do different things, and it was uh, compared to placebo. So for instance, if you're going to look at apoptosis um, or programmed cell death, we could stop that by 50% using a red laser. We also know red lasers are, work for many different things like uh, TNF-alpha. Um, if you're gonna look at fibrosis, we seen it looks like 405 nanometer works better for that because probably because it has more energy. Um, for, for some reason, the only thing that stimulated stem cells was 532 nanometers. So every wavelength has a benefit, which is why we use different wavelengths. So why we do so much research is figure out, okay, which wavelength when we go to a clinical trial is going to work best in a clinical trial. 
And I will tell you uh, the beauty of working with Travis is we get to talk about where we're going in the future. We seem to be heading more towards shorter wavelengths or more efficacious. But for us, that means we got to go and redo our clinical trials. So we did our original neck and shoulder study with just red. When we found out the fibrosis looks really good, why not combine red and green? And what we found out is red, I'm sorry, red and violet. Red and violet seem to work better than red. Now, if you're looking at a acute condition, um, red seems to work better. So it, it's just knowing which wavelengths to use. And what else? Yeah, uh, Rob, since you already brought up that Rokine article earlier, the uh, they measured different wavelengths. The strongest action potential of the nerve was actually green, followed by violet, then red. And they also looked at infrared, and infrared had no effect on the nerve at all. Uh, so it is kind of every laser, as Steve mentioned, has a different drug like effect. Uh, so there's not, I'm not saying there's one wavelength that's a cure all. Uh, that's why the fun part of being researchers or doctors is you get to choose the best wavelength per and condition. Think about that previous question you had about those thermal lasers that are treating the nerve, they're all infrared. So if you're not affecting the, 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 the nerve with an infrared laser, all you're affecting is it with heat. And we know heat's temporary. So we're looking for photochemical changes. We're looking for tissue regeneration. That's not gonna happen with heat. So what it sounds like to, again, anything photothermal may not be a good choice for a nerve, clearly as we wrapped up the nerve root concept. However, the lower the wavelength, it appears the greater the value of photonic energy or electromagnetic transfer of energy. We, we, we definitely believe that, yeah. So, I mean, I, I was going to ask you what's new. Uh, you guys kind of did it. Um, but um, was there anything else you wanted to share? What's new? W what's next? What can all these doctors expect from you in, in the next year to three years? A lot. <laughs> yeah, we, we probably have close to a dozen ongoing studies. Uh, a couple, as Steve already mentioned, was uh, we're looking at diabetic neuropathy, uh, tinnitus. Uh, we had Mayo Clinic reach out to us. Uh, they want to look at our current FDA clear fat loss laser in conjunction with their Mayo diet. Uh, they're also going to look at uh, blood markers like uh, interleukin-6, uh, C-reactive protein. So that's a really neat study. We're looking at erectile dysfunction. Yeah. Um, we're uh, university, autism. Yeah, yeah, autism. The University of Illinois actually reached out to us as well. They're doing a, they're going to do a study at one of their independent locations for macular degeneration. One of the other cool ones of Spalding Rehab, which is part of Harvard University, is going to look at uh, freshly severed spinal cords to see wow. if see if there's something we can do to help those patients at least regain function. We don't know. That's why we do research. A lot of, a lot of our research projects don't work. Um, a lot of research, all the research projects that we're selling lasers for, those have been successful. Last one I think of is uh, it's actually really cool one. Uh, just where you know medicine is going today and where you can integrate it is the lunial laser we have, which is FDA cleared for clear null growth in patients with onychomycosis. Uh, we're using a study. Uh, to show when that onychomycosis is now turbifying resistant, so it's mutated. The drug no longer works. Can laser work? Cool. So to wrap it up, there was one last question, and I think it's, I'm amiss I didn't ask you about it. So in an epigrammatic fashion, mitochondrial performance, the effect on a mitochondria from low-level laser, the Oconee laser. We could send you the study because we've already done that. Yeah. Yep. So that was my question. So, but yeah. Mitochondrial function by the best is red laser. So maybe somewhere down the road, you know, as, as we have these different wavelengths, doctors, as they want to look at a condition, can start looking at, okay, I need this wavelength for this, this wavelength for this, this wavelength for this. And it'll, it'll be all encompassing. Excellent. So, gentlemen, this has been great. I know you're really busy. I know it's a holiday week. Um, a couple people asked me, will you be able to go in in the um, comment section and note section and add the research articles that you cited so people could look at them? Yeah, people would just um, send us an email or you could send it to us, Rob. 
uh, we'll send you all the articles. We, we, we're big people to educate themselves because I will tell you, we are laser manufacturers. Laser manufacturers will lie, beg, borrow, and steal to sell you a device. Um, you need to do your own research before you invest in anything, including Arconia. You know, go to, go, to, go to the FDA website. You're going to see 42 different 510Ks from us, 20 different indications. Well, you're getting a ton of thank yous. Um, we'll get those articles up. If anybody needs to get in contact with one of you gentlemen, could you let them know how? Yeah, they can reach out to me direct. Uh, the toll-free line to Erconia is 1-888-242-0571 and then extension 501. Or just ask for tracks. Yeah. yeah. Or if, Rob, I'm not sure how this uh, live stream works, but if I can just post my email, I can do that as well. Yeah, what you do is in the comments and everything, we'll take care of it. You guys hang on. I'll talk to you in a moment. Okay. I just want to thank everybody for taking time out of their busy day. This has been great, gentlemen. We need to do this again. I really appreciate you helping me um, debunk the methods. And um, we do, we're getting people who want the recording and everything like that. So we'll take care of that. But for everybody listening, I've got Mr. Steve Shanks, Travis Sabins. My name is Dr. Rob Silverman. Always yours in health. Thank you.